Welcome to a code report solution video. In this video, I'm going to be refactoring some C code to C++ to Rust, and then also looking at the equivalent Haskell code to see how functional languages influenced Rust. And if you stay tuned to the end, I'm also going to do a short comparison of the number of assembly instructions generated by each of the C, C++, and Rust solutions, which is quite interesting in my opinion. But the first question is, why am I making this video? A few days ago, or maybe now, it was a couple weeks ago, YouTube recommended me on my homepage this YouTube video from a YouTube channel I had never heard of before, Code Aesthetic. And the title of the video was Why You Shouldn't Nest Your Code, and the thumbnail says, I'm a never nester. So I was intrigued. I love programming YouTube videos. I clicked on it, and then I was very quickly disappointed. Not to say that the video is terrible, but I was hoping that the video would go in a different direction because it starts by showing you some C code and then says this code is too heavily nested and then refactors it by basically pulling a small piece of the function and just putting it in another function so that it reduces the total amount of nesting. Okay, sure, maybe that's the refactoring you wanna do. It's just not the refactoring I wanted to see. So in this video, I'm going to show you what I was hoping to see in the video and hopefully it is educational for the viewers. So let us go to the C code that was initially shown in the Never Nester video. Check out the link in the description down below if you wanna go and watch that video first. We're given a function called calculate that takes two parameters that are integers called bottom and top that form an inclusive range due to the fact that we have a less than or equal in our for loop. And we basically have an if statement that's gonna form two branches. When top is greater than bottom, we're gonna enter the first branch. It's gonna declare a local integer sum. We're then gonna have an index based for loop that goes through all the numbers between bottom and top inclusive. And anytime we encounter an even number, which we determine using our modulus two is equal to zero, we do a plus equals to our local sum and then return that sum at the end of the for loop. Otherwise we return zero. And this is the code we start with, hopefully pretty easy to understand. And we are now for the rest of the video gonna refactor this first into C++ and then show the equivalent Rust code and then some Haskell at the end. So the first thing we're gonna do is change this to C++, which requires doing absolutely nothing. I compiled this with GCC 12.2 for both the C and C++ code and it works perfectly fine. And for a couple unit tests gives the same answer. So. Nothing to do here. We'll look at the assembly generated by both or the number of instructions later. But the next change we're gonna make is just reformatting this because there's too much white space in this for my liking. Everyone's got different preferences, but for the purposes of this video, we're gonna make this a little bit more dense, which I prefer. This obviously is not a semantic change. So our first semantic change is going to be using something from C20 called views iota. So here we are basically replacing our index based for loop with a range based for loop, which is now basically looping through each number in the views iota range that is determined by basically the views iota adapter here. So it's determined by passing two parameters or one, but in this case we want two, uh, bottom and top plus one because it is not inclusive. It doesn't include the last number that you want to. So this is basically equivalent code. And in my opinion, a lot nicer because it avoids you know abilities for uh, off by one errors because you don't have to do you know plus or minus increments and a less than comparison, you just create a range and then you can use a range based for loop, much nicer. The next semantic change that we can do now is to add a views filter along with our views iota to basically replace the if statement that we have checking for even. So we can filter out the odd numbers by basically going filter even where even is a lambda that's um, above our range based for loop now that checks the modulus two equal to zero to determine if our numbers are even. So this is quite nice in my opinion. Once again, comes from C20, so you have to be using the C20 version in order for this to work. And then the next thing we can do is basically replace our for loop and our local integer sum with a call to the C98, I believe, uh, numeric algorithm std accumulate. So we can basically get rid of our local sum, and now we have uh, an even local variable, which is our lambda, and then evens, which is a composition of our iota and our filter from the C20 views. And then we can pass this to our std accumulate numeric algorithm as sort of the begin and end of our range of evens. 
and initialize this to be zero and just return this directly. So already here, you can see by using more modern features, some of them are not that modern because std accumulate existed in C++ 98, we have redu reduced the amount of our nesting drastically, but we can continue to go further. So the next thing we're going to use is actually not in standard C++ yet, but we will be getting something like this in, I believe, C++ 23, which is the uh, standard that is being uh, you know, adopted or implemented right now. So depending on when you're watching this in the future, you might actually be able to use this without calling on a library. Here we need to use a library though, which is the range v3, which gives us access to a ranges accumulate. So this is not the standard accumulate. And this gives us the ability to pass the range directly as our first argument to our accumulate algorithm. So we still have the zero at the end of our accumulate algorithm as the initial value, but we don't need to declare a local called evens and then call the dot begin and dot end we can just pass the view directly which is even nicer in my opinion and there is one next thing we can do but before we're going to do that we basically are going to get rid of the std views namespace because at this point it's going to make the code a little bit messy so if we just declare namespace rv equals std views we can replace the two std views with rv and at this point we can now make our change, uh, which is going to irritate some people because I know there are some people that hate the ternary operator, but we can get rid of our if else branch because we're basically doing two things that do returns and return this into a single statement that is the uh, ternary operator. And it basically has two different branches now. So we check his top less than or equal to bottom. And this we're just inverting the comparison to be able to put the zero first. And then otherwise we do our call to ranges accumulate. That is a composition of iota and filter. For some of you that have never seen any of this, it might seem overwhelming, but once you get used to this stuff, in my opinion, it's actually much, much more readable than the code we started with. And it's more declarative, it's more functional, it's a single statement, and sure, it makes use of a ternary expression. I'm a big fan of the ternary expression because it leads to more declarative code. And um, it's not ideal. Ideally, I'd be able to pipe the ranges accumulate um, after the iota and filter, but unfortunately, we don't have that in C++. However, in Rust, we can do the exact same thing we're doing here, except just slightly nicer, except it's actually way nicer, and it's the following. So note, we no longer have need for a ternary expression because it handles the case where um, bottom is going to be less than or equal to top using the dot dot equals operator that forms a range. And we don't have the pipe operator here, but we have filter and we have a built-in sum, which is the equivalent of our accumulate. Our lambda is much, much more uh, readable and concise in my opinion. And this is the epitome of beautiful code. I would reformat this a little bit differently for slideware, but you know, this is basically the exact same code. You can just make the font a tiny bit bigger and it's slightly more readable, but Rust format would keep this all in one line. However, when you do start to chain these operations together and go past a certain length, this is how Rust format would format it. And this is just absolutely gorgeous in my opinion. Um, the i32s are more informative than the ints, which are implicitly on most platforms, in 32 underscore T. Just super beautiful. Lambdas, you know, these are the iterator. This is sort of using the iterator trait, which is the spiritual equivalent of ranges in C20 and C23. Uh, Rust is phenomenal here for, you know, pieces of code like this. And like I mentioned before, we don't need to make use of the ternary operator because the range created by the double dot equal operator is going to take care of that case where um, bottom is sort of less than top and it's just going to automatically return you zero. Absolutely beautiful. And at this point, some of the most astute observers and viewers of this video will be thinking in your head, the Rust code is actually not equivalent to the C and C++ versions of the code. And that's because, not because I think I made a mistake or the Rust code is wrong, but because I think there was a bug in the initial C code that got carried over to each of these C++ solutions. And I wonder if anyone has seen that bug. If so, hit the comment section down below and said, I saw it first. But basically that bug, I think is the following. If you take a look at this for loop, the range that is defined by this for loop is an inclusive range. It starts at bottom, increments up to top, and includes top. It's a less than equal to top. However, the if statement does not cover that case where bottom is equal to top. So if we have top and bottom both equal to six, it'll return zero. However, based on this for loop, 
you should actually return the value of an even number if both top and bottom are equal to that even number. And the Rust code will return you six, which is why I think it's not actually a bug importing it from C and C++ to Rust. It's a bug that is not actually, it's, it's a bug that's materialized if you have the proper unit tests. And I guess if you had the unit tests in C and C++ in the first case, you would notice the bug and you'd fix it. But the point here is that if you were thinking in your head, there was a mistake porting this to Rust. I actually think that materializes the bug in the C and C++ code, not in the Rust code itself. So food for thought, maybe that is what the intent, uh, initial intent of that function was. We'll never know. But that's my guess. Maybe we can contact the author of Code Aesthetic and ask, ask them. All right. I promised that we would look at the equivalent Haskell code, which is actually quite similar to the Rust code. And that's because Rust was heavily inspired by the ML language family and, you know, some people say it's more influenced by OCaml. Some people say it's more influenced by Haskell. Potato, potato, you know, they're both very similar languages when comparing it to C++ and C. And this is the Haskell code. So you'll note we are also defining a range using the dot dot operator, very inspired. And then we are filtering even. We have a built-in even predicate, so we don't even need to spell it out in Haskell. And then we just sum after that. And if we compare these two, you can see how similar they are and that they are very much, you know, spiritual equivalents, even though Rust and Haskell are very different languages. All right, so that is a comparison of C to C++ to Rust and to Haskell. All of the links to these solutions and each of the sort of changes will be linked in the description down below in a GitHub repo that I call content. But I also promised that we would do a comparison of the count of assembly instructions generated by each of the C, C++, and Rust uh, pieces of code. So this is that comparison. So you can see on the very far left, we have our C code. And note that the uh, green and blue bars, bars correspond to compiling with the O2 and O3 optimizations. Um, the equivalents in Rust are, I think, hyphen opt, hyphen level um, two and three. And uh, I think those are equivalent in these cases or all cases. And I can't remember actually what version I compiled with Rust. I think it was 1.63, but um, the details are in the uh, Gobbled example that's linked in the repo that I mentioned that you can find down in the description down below. But if we walk through these, not super in detail, but you can see that C, C++, and the reformatted C++ all have identical assembly, uh, generated assembly, which is great because you would definitely not expect anything uh, formatting to have an impact. And uh, it's great to see that C and C++ are identical here um, because you didn't change any of the code. Views IOTA does increase, I think, O2 by an instruction or two and O3 by a few instructions. Uh, but what's very interesting is that views filter um, changes it a lot. So it increases the number of O2 instructions but decreases the number of O3 instructions. Then uh, uh, std accumulate, ranges accumulate, and the ternary operator changed nothing. And C++ format, which behind the scenes, this was sort of left off the slide deck. I was using, I believe, std uh, io.h for each of these. But I wanted to see what the impact of using the C++20 format library. And the increase there was like an instruction or two in both the O2 and O3 uh, generated assembly. So read into this what you will. A bit, a bit interesting that the O2 was shorter for up until the IOTA, but then it completely switched. But on average, I guess it's the same across them. I don't really know. I'm not an assembly expert. Uh, but then we get to the very end, Rust, O2 and O3 are the same, and they had 50 instructions uh, for both of those cases. So does this make a difference at the end of the day? I will leave that to the viewer to determine, and you can debate in the comment section down below. I will conclude the video there. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something, and there will be a follow-up video being released about two days from now, which is going to be a behind the scenes of how I made 80% of this video, because the number one question that I get is, how do I do my code transitions? And if you are interested in finding out that, be sure to subscribe and look for that video in about two days from when this video is released. All right, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and have a great day.